It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Rick Harrison. I've known for a while, 20 to 25 years, and I've always known him as Rick. They gave me a little bio that he turned in, and it says Michael Harrison. And I asked him about it, and he said, Michael's my professional name. So I don't know if that means he's some kind of an actor or if he's a, a, a comedian or just what that is, but that's his professional name, he says. At any rate, Rick was born in uh, 1973 in Stockton, California. Uh, he and his wife, Tina, have two children, Michaela and Madison. Uh, Rick is going to be joining us here at Southeast as one of our instructors, and he'll wear a few hats uh, for us in order to uh, uh, facilitate the work that we try to do in the preacher training school here. Uh, Rick graduated from Freed Hardman University with a BA in Biblical Studies. Currently, he is working on his MDiv from Heritage, if I remember correctly. And uh, after graduation from Freed Hardeman, he preached for a couple of years in Noonan, Georgia. And then for the last 20 or so years, he has served as uh, the preacher for the Pleasant Hill Congregation in Pleasant Hill, California. And uh, I'm excited about the topic that he will be dealing with today, only in the Lord from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, verses 39 and 40. And I invite your, your careful attention and your kind attention to Rick as he breaks the bread of life to us. Good afternoon. From what I understand, there's nothing better than listening to the gospel on a full stomach. Is that right? Wake me when I'm done. No, don't. I think uh, we'll all be able to sit through this and dig into the Word of God and be fed again. Uh, my wife, when I met her, she said, well, what is your name? Is it Rick or Michael? And I said, yes. She said, what's your mama call you? I said, Rick. She goes, all right, you're Rick. So you're welcome to call me Rick. That's what my mama calls me. <laughs> Let me say something before we get into our text tonight or this afternoon. Uh, about the institution that God has ordained that we call marriage. It stands as the oldest institution of all the institutions that God has created. It has been given to mankind uh, on the whole for the human race to enjoy the proper place, that is, to enjoy human sexuality. It's the proper place for the raising of children and building character. Now, when you come to the church, the church is an exclusive organization. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is this. It's reserved only for those who would submit their wills to the will of God. The church is exclusive. You must submit in obedience to the will of God. Well, since... The church is exclusive, but marriage is universal. Well, it was for that reason that it was necessary for Scripture to address God's will regarding Christian marriage, even at times married to unbelievers. And in our text, not the specific passage we're going to be looking at, but in chapter 7, the Apostle Paul does just that. He says this, if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consent, uh, consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. Case settled. We don't have to look at that anymore, do we? That is the will of God. If I find myself married to an unbeliever, whether it be by bad decision, whether it be by uh, a spouse falling from the grace of God or leaving the Lord, or whatever it might be, the Bible teaches that I am bound by the oath that I made, and I will remain in that marriage. Thus, the same law that governs marriage for believers also governs that same institution for unbelievers. The Bible recognizes, and we must express the truth that the Bible teaches that a believer can be married to an unbeliever. 
God will recognize that. However, I might say this. It would be a mistake to assume that God is pleased with his children binding themselves to an unbeliever. Now that brings us to our text. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39 and 40. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. A congregation, and let me say this, a congregation that he had more trouble with, more problems with than any other church that he interacted with. Chapter 7 represents a series of answers that Paul is giving to the church at Corinth that presumably they had sent to him, dealing with the issue, specifically in this chapter, of marriage. And so the issues here center around marriage. In chapter 7 and verse 39 and 40, Paul sets forth a general truth here that we're going to look at. And since they've given me chapter 39 and 40, we're going to deal with both of these. It says this, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. Yet, in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God. I tell you what, when Paul wanted you to listen to him, he certainly knew how to get your attention, didn't he? <laughs> I, too, have the Spirit of God. Well, Paul, speak up. We'll listen. Now, here's the problem that we might have. What is going on? Why is it that it seems that Paul is discouraging the practice of marriage? I thought when God looked down at Adam and he saw Adam, he said, It is not good for man to be alone. Is that still true? I think so. Be fruitful and multiply. Subdue the earth and fill it. Does God still want us to do that? I believe so. Marriage is an honorable institution. And the bed is undefiled. Paul, <laughs> what are you saying? That it's better for her to be alone. That she remain as Paul is, that is single. I remember I sat at the feet of Brother Wayne Jackson. I got to hear him preach every Sunday. For many, many years. And I was blessed by that. And I remember Brother Wayne Jackson would say this on several occasions. Whenever you find a text that is shrouded in some difficulty or where it is shrouded in some obscurity, you will often find a verse that is key that will unlock the meaning of the text. So all we have to do is say, hey, let's see if there's some verse here that helps us unlock the meaning of what Paul is getting at because it certainly doesn't seem to fit with the rest of Scripture. After all, how could we have elders if we didn't have godly marriages? What are you saying, Paul? Well, jump to verse 25, chapter 7, verse 25. And I think we find the key to unlocking the meaning of what he says there. He says this. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no commandment from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the mercy, uh, by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. All right. Well, we don't have a command. That's good to know. Well, what is it? Here's his judgment. I think in view of the present distress. So you might want to underline that. We've got a hint here. We've got a statement that helps us know that there is a special situation going on. And this is why he's making this statement. Because of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. Uh, but if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned yet. Circle that. Underline this next statement because he gives us the same idea. Those who marry will have worldly troubles and I would spare you that. Worldly troubles, why? Because of the present distress. The truth of marriage stands true today. It is an honorable institution. It's not good for man to be alone. And, of course, we need godly homes today. 
Well, let's get into verse 39. Verse 39 says this. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes. I'm stopping right there. I want you to keep that statement in mind. Paul has just given us the most important truth regarding marriage. We'll come back to it. I'm tempted to go back in, but we'll come back to it. Now, let's take a look and see what he says next. She's free to marry whom she wishes, but he adds this. Only in the Lord. I did not know that was a controversial statement. (laughs) But apparently it is. Only in the Lord. What does Paul mean by that? What is he saying By only in the Lord. I think there are only two possibilities. One, it has reference to marriage. Or we might say it this way. It has reference to her. That when she marries, she ought to do so consistent with her in Christ relationship. You know, when when we decided to become a Christian, we were put in Christ. Christ. Did you know that? Yes, we all know that, don't we? I am in Christ. You are in Christ. If you have obeyed the gospel, you're in an in Christ relationship. And all of the obligations surrounding that are yours. Which means every bit of the New Testament I ought to study, understand, and obey. When I understand that it applies to me. Now, there's another idea here. It is a reference to the who she marries. She should marry a Christian. Someone else who also is in the Lord. I take that position. I think that's what it's saying. But I'm going to be honest with you. I see very little difference in the two. Let me explain why. If she marry a Christian, that's certainly consistent with the New Testament teaching. Don't you know God wants Christians to marry other Christians? Yes. I don't know of a preacher who would get up in this pulpit this afternoon and be so bold as to say, God wants you all to marry unbelievers. And if one ever does, run him out because he doesn't belong up here. Well, where do we get that idea from? Where did that come from? That I'm going to encourage everyone who is a believer to marry another believer. Where did that come from? It didn't come from Rick. It came from God. It came from the principles. It came from the explicit testimony of the Bible. And we're going to look at that here in just a minute. Anybody who is familiar with the basic fundamentals of the Bible, and especially, listen here, the kind of passion that ought to be characteristic of the child of God, ought to be aware of this fact. That God does not want his children marrying up with unbelievers. And one would expect that God has given some scriptural insight regarding this very idea. Well, I think that we have a passage right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39 that gives that insight. But is it consistent with the rest of the New Testament? I believe that it is. The idea that God's people ought to marry within the faith, it's not a novel teaching. There are a number of Old Testament passages that also teach this very idea. In the book of Proverbs, there is a reference. And the American Standard translates it this way. A reference to strange women. Ladies, don't get offended. You know good and well there are strange women out there. There are strange men out there too. But here's the reality. What is that reference talking about? It's in Proverbs chapter 2 verse 16, 22 verse 14. What are these strange women? And of course we can add to that strange men. There are two ways in which that is used. It's used in this way, where someone might seduce you towards fornication, where they bat their eyes and they pooch their lips out. And the the Old Testament says, stay away from them. They are a poison. That's one way in which strange is used. But there's another way 
in which that term or that phrase, strange women, is used. In the book of 1 Kings, we are told, listen here, that King Solomon is said to have loved and married many strange women. Why did he do that? <laughs> because the Bible instruction regarding these women was very clear. This is what it says in 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 1. From the nations concerning which the Lord has said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you. Now look at the reasoning here. Circle that next word, for. Well, what am I looking for? An explanation. A reason. For what? They, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. As a matter of fact, we have in Ezra to Nehemiah, there are a number of reference and examples to the children of Israel when they were in Babylonian captivity. They married foreign women or strange women as the American standard puts it. When the children of Israel came back to the homeland again during the time of those migrations under Zerubbabel and again during those uh, under Ezra and Nehemiah, decrees were issued. And here was the decree that they should put away these strange or these foreign women. Now, sometimes it is argued in this way that the only reason God did not permit the children of Israel to marry outside of the race is because they were keeping the bloodline pure. Well, I'll say this. The instruction to put away their foreign wives in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah was a very unusual situation. And we may not understand all that is involved in it. And I think there probably was some reasoning there about keeping the bloodline pure. Pure, but the Bible gives explicit testimony, and the explicit testimony is this that they will turn your heart away from God. That's the testimony. This is the reason why God did not want his people to marry outside of the faith because they will turn the heart away from him. And God is what? A jealous God. We owe him. Our love, our allegiance, our devotion, our everything. Now, I'd like to direct your attention to another passage, but this time in the New Testament. In 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, and we'll begin reading here in about verse 14 and following. He says to these brethren, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Now all of these questions he is about to ask in a series have an implied negative answer. In other words, well, what fellowship has righteousness with iniquity? None. What fellowship should there be? Absolutely zero. We have no relationship, no connection in those regards. Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? Isn't that what we're talking about here? Should a Christian marry an unbeliever? What does that text mean? Only in the Lord. It certainly is consistent with the teaching that we find in scripture isn't it again all of those questions are answered in this way no none with regard to those questions Paul next affirms this for we are the temple of the living God he says that about the New Testament church that's us for we are the temple of the living God as God said I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, well, therefore what? Well, because of the distinction, the differences between light and darkness, between Christ and Satan, between righteousness and unrighteousness, the temple of God and idols and etc. cetera. 
Because of these distinct differences, the apostle, by inspiration, admonishes these brethren, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. He goes on, he says this, and touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord God Almighty. Now, I bring this passage up because this is the group of people we're talking about. Isn't it? Yes, the Corinthian brethren. And they were having some problems. Let me make a couple of quick observations about the text. There is an indication that some of the Christians at Corinth were mingling they're fellowshipping with unbelievers. When Paul says in verse 14, do not be unequally yoked, the word not is the Greek negative particle may, spelled M-E but pronounced may. Whenever that particle, that, Greek, uh, that particular Greek term is used with a present tense imperative form, it means this, stop doing what you are currently doing. Whenever that Greek term may is used with the aorist tense imperative form, it means don't start doing whatever is under consideration. Well, what do you know here? The Greek term may is used with the present tense imperative. And it means this. What's Paul saying? Paul's saying this. Would you, brethren, stop? unequally yoking yourselves with unbelievers. This means that some of them were doing it. Some of them were ignoring the distinction between light and darkness, between Christ and Satan, between a believer and an unbeliever. And guess what? Paul rebukes them for that. And then he goes on, he says, "Is come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Let me ask you this question. Let's think about this for a minute. Is he suggesting that, hey, I'm going to go out here, I'm going to find me a nice little plot of land, I'm going to get about 50 acres, and all us Christians are going to go out there. And we're going to separate ourselves from all these worldly unbelievers. No, I don't believe that's what he's saying. In fact, I know that's not what he's saying because how in the world would we be evangelistic if we did that? How in the world would we fulfill the Great Commission? How would we be a light on a hill? So clearly, that's not what is under consideration. Well, what is he saying? I think there are two extremes. There's that extreme. Let me go out away from everybody, and I'm going to set up my own community. Nobody who's an unbeliever is going to be able to come in. But then there's the other extreme. I'm going to go out and make my home with them and have children with them. And raise my children with them. I think that's another extreme. And here's the reality. God says, come out from among them and be separate. And then there's a promise associated with that. Listen to this. And I will welcome you. I will be your God and you will be, I will be your father and you will be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord. Now, the Apostle Paul says, be not unequally yoked with an unbeliever. I feel like maybe we need to identify what an unbeliever is. Somebody says, well, an atheist is an unbeliever. Well, that's true. An atheist, by their own definition, is an unbeliever. But I think the Bible indicates that an unbeliever is much more narrow or maybe broad than we think it is. As a matter of fact, the Bible knows of only two classes of people, believer and unbeliever. Those who are classified as believers are separate from those who are unbelievers. And those who are denominated as unbelievers, they're not the same as believers. Let me give you some ideas associated with this. If you're outside of Christ, you're an unbeliever. If you're out of the body of Christ, if you're out of the church, then you are an unbeliever. You're either in Christ or out of Christ, in the church or out of the church, a believer or a non-believer. And John chapter 3 and verse 36 is a great text to illustrate this. The Lord is having an encounter with the Jews on this occasion. 
And they began to interact. And the Bible says this in John chapter 3 and verse 36. He that believes on the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not believe shall not see life. The reason the translators have translated this, and I like this better than the King James, because the King James uses believe twice, but there are two different words here. And so the reason the ESV and the ASV translated or render two different words, because there's two different words here. The first one is pistuo, and the second one is apatheo, or apatho. And two different words, and so they translate it with two different words. And so there's a clear indication here. What's the indication? That you're either a believer or one who does not obey. Oh, isn't that interesting? So the Lord clearly draws a contrast between a believer and one who has not obeyed. Let me say this. Did you know that you can actually believe in Christ? Believe the things that he says, but until you translate that belief into obedience, the Bible still designates you as an unbeliever. That's right. John chapter 8 and verse 30 says this. As he spake these things, many believed on him. Jesus said to those Jews who had believed on him, and then they have this dialogue and this interaction. And he talks about freedom. I'm not going to go through the entire text. It goes all the way down through verse 44. But verse 44 is a big one. He tells them about freedom. That if you believe on the Son, you'll have freedom. They say, we've never been enslaved. Which, it's like they forgot their history. We've never been enslaved. Abraham is our father. And Jesus corrects him. It's this same group of people who believed on him. You know what he says to them? He says, you are of your father, the devil. Verse 44. I would say that's an unbeliever. But they had believed in him. But they did not translate that belief into obedience, did they? No. Let me ask you this question. Is believing... Jesus, or being a believer the same as being in the Lord? If I'm a believer, now we've already defined what the Bible definition is of a believer. The Bible definition of a believer is this, one who has obeyed the gospel. Say that's me. Am I the same as the person who's in the Lord? Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Now listen here. If you're a believer and you've obeyed the gospel, are you the same as the person who has had their sins forgiven? Yes, you are. Are you the same as the person who is uncondemned? You certainly are. I only know of two, I'll just add this to it. I only know of two passages that express how a person gets into Christ. You are baptized into Christ. Romans chapter 6 and verse 1 and following, Galatians chapter 2. You are baptized into Christ. So I think we've expressed this idea of what a believer versus an unbeliever is. Paul says to these brethren, stop Yoking yourself with unbelievers. Stop being unequally yoked with unbelievers. Well, what does that mean? Well, the language goes back to the Old Testament. I better keep an eye on my time. I might have to start talking real fast. The language goes back to the Old Testament, to Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 9 through 11. There are three commandments there that are about the strangest commandments I've ever seen. They're strange indeed. And the commandments are this, you will not, here it is, sow two different kinds of seed in your vineyard. What, Lord? Really? That's right. Don't do it. Okay. You are not to plow an ox and a donkey together. Really? Two different species. No, don't do it. Okay, Lord. Then he says, you are not to wear a garment with two different kinds of material, linen and wool. Well, I'll tell you what, you nearly couldn't buy anything today, could you? 
Why? All three of these regulations were designed to stress the same spiritual truth. And that truth is amplified right here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. What truth is Moses trying to express? That the idea here is, this, and they're going to see it on a daily level. They're going to see it every day that there is a difference between godliness and unrighteousness. There is a difference between the holy and the profane. There is a difference between God's people and the world. And don't ever put them together. Not when you can help it. Isn't that right? Do not be unequally yoked. Do not harness together yourself with an unbeliever. Let me talk about some of the objections that have been expressed. Only in the Lord. Brother Harrison, wouldn't that be a violation of a command here? And if I now have to repent of that command, wouldn't it mean leaving the marriage altogether? Didn't we already address that? Why do I got to go back and address that? Paul said, if you are married to an unbeliever, the general truth, the general law of God stands. God will hold you to that vow. And so the very context that we're looking at here, way back in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14, Paul addresses. So you cannot violate the law of God in order to obey the law of God. And we know that, I think. Therefore, repentance requires continued obedience to the instruction set forth regarding marriage and a changed heart. Well, a changed heart, what do you mean? Regarding the self-willed disposition I had. When I said, ooh, she's pretty. I don't care what God wants for me. I want her. Or that woman who looks at that man and says, uh-huh, he fits the bill. That's the one I want. And it doesn't matter whether or not that individual can get me to heaven. Certainly, we would all agree that this passage is not suggesting that children are permitted or God, let me say it this way, that God, God wants children, his children. Go ahead and marry an unbeliever. No, I don't think so. Let's take a look at this idea as well. There is another verse in Ephesians where Paul sets forth this idea. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Well, what does he mean by that? And many people will go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39, and say it's the same expression. It means the same thing. It means consistent with the doctrine of Christ. Paul is not suggesting that these children's parents have to be in the Lord. Well, I know that's not what he's suggesting because it goes back to Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. He says this is the first command with promise. And if you go to that original context, it's not highlighting the parents. It's highlighting the children and giving the children a promise. But as I said before, the expression in the Lord... And I think in each one of these expresses this idea, an obligation I have because I'm in the Lord. And each and every time I think it means that. But it also, in this passage, I think it's clear, highlighting whom she wills only in the Lord. To me, it seems abundantly clear on the surface and consistent with the rest of the New Testament and the Old Testament teaching, but particularly the New Testament teaching we're concerned with, that God wants and Paul is instructing her to marry a believer. Now, let me move quickly through the last uh, statement here. I told you we're going to go back to the passage here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and verse 39. Follow along with me here. Look what it says. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes. Why is it that Paul says nothing else about the commands of God regarding marriage, divorce, and remarriage? Because this right here is the only thing that matters. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. Now, let me say this. Paul is expressing here the 
ideal. God's divine ideal. This is what God wants of every single marriage. A husband and a wife who stay together for life. Right? The, Paul, the Apostle Paul here is not suggesting anything else but this. Now she can marry who she wants. And here's the divine ideal as well. Only in the Lord. That's what God wants. Only in the Lord. That is the divine standard, the highest it can possibly be. You know, so many times we think about the divine ideal of God. What do I mean? What God wants for us. Well, think about this. My little children, this is 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you might not sin. That's the divine ideal. Did you know that? Did you know that God doesn't want you to sin ever? That's true. And it is stated from Genesis to Revelation. Don't sin, don't sin, don't sin. But if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Well, hang on a minute. You see there, a lot of people say, stop right there. Hey, look, we can sin. No. The only thing that ought to matter to us is what God wants. We are his doulos. We are his slaves, his servants. And what does he want in my life? Now, why has God even allowed for forgiveness? Because of the weakness that is in the flesh. God has allowed for us to have our sins forgiven. But we don't just throw off the shackles of restraint and say, I'm going to live how I want because God has offered forgiveness. That's not it. And if our denominational friends would understand that, they would understand. We live a life in obedience, of obedience to God. And this is God's divine ideal. You know, we are losing young people in droves. Why? Well, I'll tell, I'll tell you this. This is not helping. <laughs> that young people are marrying unbelievers. They're not even thinking about, can this person get me to heaven? And we need to remind them. That you are a child of God and you need to think, number one, first and foremost, about your eternal security, about where you will be heading if you marry an unbeliever. You need to analyze. The, and I think you uh, look at Christians and make sure they're the right person for the job. Can this person get me to heaven? Will they help me raise believing children? That will help the church to grow. That will spread the gospel throughout the world. Talk about unity in the church. When we start having families that will marry in the faith. Won't that help with unity? I think it will. May God help us to submit to his will. Not what I want, but what he wants. And I should not be driven by my own passions, but for the passions I have for God. And we need to teach our young people that. And we'll have a Christian heritage that we can look back on and see all the wonderful Christian teaching that has come out of a family. And I think we have that here, don't we? And we need it to continue. And we need to teach children that God wants you to marry a believer. I'll close with this final thought. I am not looking to see what I can get away with. Am I? No. And I know that you're not looking to see what you can get away with. And we need to teach our children, don't look for what you can get away with. Look for what you can do that will make God just pleased with you. That will make him look and say like he did the patriarch Job. A man like none other. Like he did with David. One who is after his own heart. Yes, we might fail and make mistakes and we'll have to make the most of it. Some things you just can't recover from as easily as others, can you? But you can make the most of it. All along the way, looking to please God in every way. Thank you.